Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Selmy with the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you so much for joining us for the Alzheimer's Association International Conference being held in Denver, Colorado, and virtually across the globe. This year, nearly 12,000 of the brightest minds in Alzheimer's and dementia research representing 110 countries are participating. It's truly been a wonderful week. And during this talk today, we're gonna to get view updates on the latest research coming out, including some new findings on COVID-19 and the potential long-term impact it might have on cognitive function. We're gonna discuss air pollution and its possible link to dementia risk. We're gonna talk about the valuable and really importance of having diversity in clinical trial participation. And finally, we're gonna talk about the latest on treatment and talk about what's on the horizon. Today, I'm so thrilled to be joined by Dr. Heather Snyder, Alzheimer's Association Vice President of Scientific and Medical Relations. Thank you for joining us today, Heather. Absolutely, happy to be here. Now, I want to acknowledge for everyone at home that we have both had the COVID-19 vaccine and we are seated six feet apart. But Heather, so much has been in the news this week about COVID-19, including right here at AIC. So I want to start there. Can you talk to us about some of the research that came out this week? Absolutely. And, and maybe just to, to frame it in, in what we understand about COVID-19 in the brain is really about a year ago, there was some early data that suggested that individuals that had experienced COVID-19 or some individuals that experienced COVID-19 had an, a specific immune response. Some had changes in their blood brain barrier. That's the really sophisticated barrier that protects our brain. These are also biologies that we know are important in Alzheimer's disease. And so it really asked that question of, was there going to be a link? And when we look at other pandemics, such as the SARS and MERS pandemic, we also know that some individuals reported that they had some cognitive changes after having, having those viruses as well. So we actually started working with some researchers at the University of Texas, San Antonio, bringing together a global community from over 40 countries to say, how and what should we be asking? What are the questions we should be looking at? How should we be measuring and, and assessing the changes mm -hmm. in memory thinking, reasoning, our overall behavior over a period of time to understand what this impact might be. And in fact, that's what that group has been doing. And we're seeing that first data here at AAIC. So what's the key takeaway on this research? So, you know, essentially what we're seeing is that individuals, some individuals that had mm -hmm. COVID-19 are experiencing long-term changes in their memory. A group in Argentina found that for individuals that had persistent change in smell, they seem to be experiencing these changes in memory. And a group in New York found that actually individuals that had those changes mm -hmm. in memory over a period of time also had some measures of the underlying biology change that we see also changed in Alzheimer's and other brain diseases. But big takeaway, yeah. if you don't get COVID, if you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated, have that conversation with your healthcare provider. If you do get COVID, take care of yourself, especially your heart health, right? And you know, the one big thing that's really important to know is that if you did experience COVID, this does not necessarily mean you're gonna be at an increased risk. We're still trying to understand yeah. that relationship as well. And, and you know, if you are experiencing any of these symptoms, have that conversation with your healthcare provider. Make sure they're aware mm -hmm. of what you're experiencing. It sounds really interesting. And like there's a lot more to come from you and your colleagues as we're starting to uh, dive more into this and see more of the long-term impact. So we'll be staying tuned to hear what, what more research is to come from that. I wanna talk now about something that has been all over the news coming out of the AAIC this year, and that is air pollution and what we're learning about air pollution levels and the potential tied to dementia risk. So what can, what can people, what do people need to know about this? Yeah, you know, I think we've, we, we know air pollution in general is not great yeah. for our health, right? And, and we've seen past studies actually presented mm -hmm. here at AAIC that have looked at the link of where there is high levels of air pollution, we do see an increased risk of cognitive mm -hmm. decline. But what we're now also seeing is in places where they've had policies or, or uh, they've seen a reduction of their mm -hmm. air pollution, they're also seeing a reduced risk of cognitive decline in individuals. And, and one of the studies took place over 10 years in women mm -hmm. where they saw this, this reduced risk. Now, the mechanism of what might be happening, yeah. what's the underlying biology? 
One of the studies that was presented here suggested when you expose, when you're exposed or, or around high levels of air pollution for a period of time, you have some of the underlying biology changed that we see in Alzheimer's. So lots more work to be, un yeah. to be understood about what this connection might be, but it is a really important to understand the whole puzzle of what might be contributing to our risk across our lives. Yeah, and I'm wondering what um, our viewers might be thinking about, okay, what's the takeaway? What can, I, what can I do? Air pollution seems like such a big thing. What can one individual do about that? Well, I think that's where our voices are really so important is that, you know, having local, state, national legislation and policies that look to regulate mm -hmm. or, or look to, uh, uh, to reduce overall air pollution is so important and, and is part of that conversation. And Heather, this is reminding me a lot of some of the things we've talked about in past years from research coming out at AAIC and throughout the year about lifestyle, right? This is another lifestyle risk factor. Can you remind our audience about some other things they can be doing related to lifestyle? Yeah, so, and I, and I just would maybe uh, position it as that we're understanding more and more that there's things throughout our entire life that might be contributing to that, that mm -hmm. overall puzzle of why one person may develop the disease and one person may not. Uh, things like air pollution are one of those things that, you know, are part of that, but there are, might be things we can do. So whether that's being physically active if you're able or eating a balanced mm -hmm. diet if, if you're able to do that, looking at, you know, what does, what, uh, making sure your brain has all of its nutrients. You know, and there's that old adage, use it or lose it. Keep our brains active. Now, there's a lot we don't know about what that recipe is, and that's actually why the Alzheimer's Association is uh, a partnering with research teams around the country to uh, launch, or on, it's ongoing, the U.S. Pointer Trial that's mm -hmm. really looking to assess lifestyle interventions in a, in a population of people that may be at an increased risk to understand what's the impact of, of these interventions, this specific recipes, on our cognition as we age. You know, uh, Heather, you just mentioned clinical trials, and I have to tell you something that I heard as a constant theme throughout the sessions that I was uh, listening in on this week was about the need to diversify clinical trials. Um, and what was a really big theme hearing from the researchers and the scientists was we as a community, as a research community, need to do more. And in fact, there was even research that came out about this important tie of making sure we have diversity in the clinical trials. Can you talk to us a little bit about this? Absolutely. This is a, a huge gap in, in where we as a scientific field are and, and have not mm -hmm. done a good job of engaging all communities in clinical trials. Some of the work that was presented here at AAIC looked at, well, you know, individuals are more likely to participate in trials yeah. if they're asked asked to participate in the clinical trial, and that if they're asked by somebody that's from their community that can address their concerns and have that conversation with them. So there's actually some work that's going on that the Alzheimer's Association yeah. is involved in, and, uh, and in fact, this ties back to U.S. Pointer that we just talked about, about how do we look at the different ways of engaging communities as a research community and engaging all communities to ensure that our trials are diverse. Yeah, and Heather, you just mentioned something that the association's doing from a public policy perspective, along with bipartisan congressional champions, and that's the ENACT Act. Um, and that would really hit on a lot of the things that, you're, that you just spoke on, that it's about making sure we're having clinical trials that are reaching those di diverse communities, and that it's, it's contact that the, um, that the researchers themselves are representative of the communities that they're trying to recruit into. And I think that that is such an important tie that the association is doing. What can individuals at home who are watching do to grow support for the ENACT Act? Absolutely. So uh, and Laura might have to help me here, but in terms of that, there is uh, you, this is, again, adding our voice to that conversation yeah. and letting our legislators know about the importance of diversity in clinical trials for treatments, for tools for early diagnosis and detection. We need to have those work in all communities. Yeah. And so we can text ENACT ALLS, E-N-A-C-T-A-L-Z, and the number? And it's to 52886. So again, we're asking you to text ENACT ALLS, E-N-A-C-T-A-L-Z, to the number 52886. And it's going to give you a prompt, and you're going to be able to contact your members of Congress directly and ask them to co-sponsor this important bipartisan legislation in the House and Senate. So I think that's a really great next step, and it's really nice how it's all tying together um, from what we're learning about here at AAIC. Now, one final thing I want to end on is where we're at with treatment. I know that it's something we've, we've heard from folks on our Facebook, and we hear from um, the Alzheimer's community all the time. It's always so top of mind for them. Anyone who's been impacted by Alzheimer's, they want to know where are we at with treatment. So let's talk a little bit about where we're at with treatment and what's on the horizon. 
Absolutely. So I think yesterday there was actually, here at AIC, there was actually a session called Potpourri of, of the Clinical Pipeline that really looked at a number of, of different mm -hmm. ways and, and looking at the diversity of the clinical trials pipeline and, and what's moving forward. Now recently we have the FDA accelerated approval of a treatment for individuals with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease and early or, or early Alzheimer's. And, and that's really a step yeah. forward and, and it's, it's an exciting time and as we move as we move forward as a community. But Alzheimer's is a complex disease and there's a lot, there's a lot going on mm -hmm. biologically. And so thinking about treatment, it's likely going to be really at the end of the day, multiple uh, uh, combination approaches of, of lifestyle, of medications, mm -hmm. very much like how we treat other complex diseases, right? When we think about heart disease, when we think about cancers, those are other complex diseases. But this session yesterday uh, that was here at AIC, it looked at a number of different things, looking at how can we target our immune system that we know, mm -hmm. you know, especially when we know it's, it's maybe contributing to the problems, uh, the way our brain cells are talking to each other and, and what might be potential targets for that. I'm really proud that the Alzheimer's Association has funded nearly 60 clinical trials in just the last five years, really adding to that diversity through our Part the Cloud program, really a, a, a part of that moving that needle forward and, and diversifying the clinical tri trials pipeline and getting us to where yeah. we really need to be, to being able to stop all of the aspects of the biology uh, before they can continue. So as we wrap up another wonderful Alzheimer's Association International Conference, this one, the first ever hybrid one, which I thought was pretty smooth as a participant who was both um, on site, but then also did some of those virtually. I thought it was tremendous and a great way to really bring the global community together. Is there anything else that um, everyone should know about as we wrap up this AAIC? Yeah, I think for me, one of the, the uh, most amazing things about AAIC is it's such an opportunity for the global community to come together, to have that scientific discussion, share the latest science. The Alzheimer's Association is the world's largest funder of dementia, Alzheimer's and dementia science. Mm -hmm. And actually today, we have a little over 750 projects that are actively at work in 39 countries, totaling over $250 million dollars. Six continents, right, spreading, yeah. spreading around the world. And AAIC is such a tremendous opportunity for our awardees to share their work and really participate in that scientific mm -hmm. dialogue that's, that's moving that needle forward. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Snyder, Heather, for being here with us today and sharing your insights from another wonderful AAIC. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. As always, the Alzheimer's Association has resources for individuals that need support. You can find more information about the research that came out today and the projects that Heather mentioned we are funding at alz.org. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you again, Heather. Absolutely. Pleasure.